Today we are met in continuing pursuit of a pledge made to ourselves at the commencement of this our golden jubilee, that at its end, we, we would have inscribed in on our monuments for posterity's witness, the names of those who could see while many others watched, who were undaunted by adversity, and through whose vision we are what we are today. Sir Sidney Martin came to Barbados in 1964 as principal of the fledgling College of Arts and Science of the University of the West Indies in Barbados. Following the return to Mona of Professor Leslie Robinson, whom he honored a few weeks ago as the first person to assume the duties of principal. He came initially on a two year secondment from his post as registrar at Mona. He came, he saw, he conquered, and made Barbados his home and our campus his life's work. I am told that those who may have felt challenged by the pace of our recent expansion would have been truly sobered by the frenetic pace of development in those early years, so aptly chronicled by Philip Sherlock, Rex Nettleford, and our own Karen Ford Warner. Of course, they're all our own. <laughs> the consolidation of the harbor site's preparedness for teaching, recruitment of our full and part-time staff, identification of complementary teaching locations, the accommodation of our expanding student numbers and course offerings were all things that had to be dealt with and dealt with as matters of urgency. And two years later, in 1996, our students could stand on the shores of the harbor site, raise their eyes onto the hills, and see their certain future. For etched against the sky, rising steadily from the ground, was the first phase of their permanent home at Cave Hill. The administration and arts block, the first floor of the main library, and the chemistry and the physics blocks. We are told that Sir Sidney, working with architects, Gardner Tomlin Associates, oversaw this particular project with missionary zeal and with the punctiliousness, meticulousness, and commitment to duty for which this distinguished public servant was to become legendary. We could gather here today in no more fitting place than this quadrangle, which is still our hallowed ground. A ground defined by the boundaries of our first built space, boundaries which we have rolled back steadily over the years as we have continued to Sydney's work. It is the ground on which year after year, our graduates in increasing numbers were presented to their chancellor in fulfillment of our mission of service to our constituent communities. Those steps just across from me were a favorite meeting place where I am told many a relationship enduring or transient was forged. Not a part of Sir Sidney's master plan, but an added value which I believe he would have, would have acknowledged with his, his customary graciousness. In our presentations this morning, we will hear from those who knew Sir Sidney well, and in varying capacities. For my own part, in my first few years at Cave Hill would have coincided with his final years as principal. But as we all know, in university hierarchies, the social space between a principal and a lowly assistant registrar is not inconsiderable. I, however, observed him with some awe. We will hear of a man who has left a giant footprint on our university and who was unstinting in his service to the public good in Jamaica, Barbados, and beyond. At the time of his retirement, he was the longest serving member of the UE staff having served variously as lecturer, then senior lecturer, and head in the Department of Chemistry at Mona, sub-dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, secretary to the senior common room, warden of Taylor Hall, chairman of Wigget Mona, and a registrar of the Mona campus. Truly a formidable arsenal of skills, which steeled him for his ultimate challenge as principal of Cave Hill. One is tempted to think that Sir Sidney 
having represented in one form or other almost every university stakeholder group, was possibly his own best advisor. Legend has it, and I am unsure of the provenance of this one, that a staff member in a fit of pique and in a moment of consummate folly, in a meeting with Sir Sidney, threatened his resignation. By the time he returned to his office, he found waiting a letter crafted with a registrar registrarial precision for which Sir Sidney was famous, accepting his resignation on behalf of the Appointments Committee and thanking him for his service. <laughs> this unique combination of academic, reg registrar, student advisor, and wicked man should surely have been enough to give pause to any ill-thought action which the fecundity of university life might produce. We will hear why Carl Jackman, former university registrar, a sober man not given to superlatives, <laughs> was moved to say that the progress made by Cave Hill Campus in its 20, then 20 years of existence is its own unspoken tribute to Sir Sidney's administrative ability. It was therefore fitting that Sir Sidney should have been knighted by Her Majesty the Queen in 1979 for his contribution to education. The title, Sir, is of course an honorific shared by our next speaker, who has already had a surfeit of honors heaped on his still youthful head. And who too <laughs> has been honored for his service to education. Our naming project as part of our 50th anniversary is his concept about which he is passionate. Distinguished historian that he is, he has a fine sense of history's moments. He felt, with apologies to Shakespeare, that this was the, the, the tide in our affairs that needed to be taken at the flood, the full sea on which we were afloat. This was the time to honor our own for all posterity to witness. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome to the podium our principal and pro-vice chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles. It is entirely fit and I believe for us to pay tribute and to recognize the work of those who have established this campus in its contemporary form. I have tried to imagine what it must have been like in 1964. An open place, a grass piece, a community which has been so well captured in Sir Wolfville's recent book, which we will launch shortly and which we will invite all of you to attend. And you will put up your hand now and say, yes, we will attend. Um, to convert that space into a university campus. It could have been no easy feat. With scarce resources, an environment that was being urged to receive a university campus fully into itself, it must have been a very daunting task indeed. And Sir Sidney was obviously the person best fitted to implement, to implement the strategy and to give effect to the campus. I arrived at the Kefal campus in 1984, which would have been his last year. That was the year in which he retired and Sir Keith succeeded him and I succeeded Sir Keith in the history department. And as you all know, um, it has been two occasions that I have traveled from Mona to Kayfield to replace Sir Keith. So I have said to him on numerous occasions, I have a very keen interest in his next job. <laughs> and whatever it is, I think he should seek my approval. <laughs> but I came to Kayfield in 84, um, therefore I did not work with Sir Sidney Martin, but I met with him on one or two occasions on my visits from Mona, where I had been since 1979. And I would visit Kefil from time to time, and I remember one conversation I had with him. But I was always impressed by what the registrar has said, his calm graciousness, um, his focus, his focused approach. But I found here clearly the evidence of his work. A very cohesive campus, a campus that was very well managed, both in its registrarial function as well as financially. A campus with a cohesive sense of community, which was very strong. I recall that there was a tremendous intimacy of the KFL family, and this was quite unique because 
the way in which this campus banded together was quite extraordinary. Uh, and Sakif would have inherited that um, and built upon it. Uh, because in the financial difficulties that came in the early 1990s, it was precisely that sense of community at KFL that enabled Sakif to negotiate through those difficult times. I found a campus also that the foundations has been laid clearly for its strong academic development. But when you, if you revert to 1964, and you try to imagine the building of a campus, scarce resources, academics would have been drawn to Mona because of its legacy and its dynamism. And therefore, Sassini would have been building a campus with a group of persons who wanted to be here, who took decisions to come here, and to merge that with academics who were serving in the school system, who were brought here to put together the foundations of an academic community, and to find skillful people from the public sector and from other communities to come and take responsibility for its financing and its registry. And that was clearly a very, very successful strategy because it worked. It worked and KFL, KFL was, well, was well on its way. The ceremony then is entirely fitting because this library would have been the center of much of what became the campus because the heart of a campus invariably is its academic resources and this is clearly the place that would have held the entire structure together. This would have been a place that gave effect to programs, curriculum development, and, and all of those issues. Now, the plan going forward, and I should share with you, the plan going forward is that the government of Barbados has committed to the building of a new library at the Kefal campus. You are all aware that we broke ground a year ago to begin the construction of this library, but financial difficulties intervene, and that project has been put on hold. But we are having con those conversations with the government because we have been assured that at the most convenient moment when there is an, an alleviation in the budgetary commitments to the campus, we will return to the campus project, and we are making preparations for that. The plan is that going forward, we are going to develop this entire part of the campus as the science and technology park. We are getting ready to roll out the science and technology initiative of the KFL campus, which will see the convergence of greater resources uh, and the science and technology community. As you know, the, the expansion of the last 10 years has been driven primarily by expansion in the social sciences faculty, uh, where we align the campus to the services economy structure that is Barbados. And so we expanded the campus in banking, in finance, in tourism, in project management, all of the disciplines required to drive the services economy. And we believe that that was a successful strategy. But going forward, we are going to divert uh, more resources into science and technology. And already, we have laid out what it's going to look like, what the new faculty would look like. And we are master planning that. And we're going to see KFL gradually turning slowly, like a cruise ship in a harbor, to science and technology for the digital age. And that is what we are now getting ready to do. And this library will be a critical part of this new academic disciplinary architecture. This will become in the future. And we will seek, of course, all the appropriate adjustments. The Sydney Martin Library for Science and Technology. And in fact, this is going to become the Science and Technology Library that will be the heart of the science and technology revolution that will take place at KFL. And this will be entirely fitting because Sir Sidney was a scientist, he was a technologist, and he would have been happy to see the disciplines to which he subscribed 
become the heart of the KFL campus going forward. So that, this is really the remit that we will implement. And so we are, we are honored to begin this process. The Sydney Martin Library, which will evolve into the Sydney Martin Library for Science and Technology at KFL in the second dispensation. So we have many plans. We are putting Sydney Martin to work. He, uh, there is no free lunch. Uh, we are going to use him, and we're going to use his legacy, we're going to use his character, his contribution, and we're going to use that legacy to drive the science and technology initiative here at the campus. So it's a pleasure for me then to welcome everyone here this morning, the entire KFL family, thank you all for coming, uh, the Martin family, and thank you for allowing us to do this in memory of the city. Thank you, welcome. The tributes we pay to our distinguished university administrators are implicitly tributes to their families. Their families are in fact their chief enablers. It is right that such tribute should be explicit. Although its rewards are not insignificant, the university can be a hard master or mistress as depending on one's perspective. The demands of unreasonable hours and frequent travel must be indulged by those who must now be acknowledged. We have already saluted Lady, Mar Lady Martin. We place on record our indebtedness to her and other members of the immediate Martin family. We have with us today two of Sidney's sons. There are three of them. The two with us today are Philip and Roger Martin. Their brother Richard has sent to us his deep regrets at his inability to be present, and he has wished us the best for, for this morning's ceremony. I now invite to the podium Sir Sidney's youngest son, Philip Martin, to give remarks on behalf of the family, the Martin family. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. I must say it's rather daunting uh, having to speak after Mrs. Reed and uh, Sir Hillary, and thankfully, um, Sir Frank will come after me. Uh, as I make this little presentation on behalf of my father, you will forgive me if some of what I say may be a bit repetitive, and of course there wasn't any collusion between Mrs. Wade and I, it's strictly coincidental. So Sir Frank Arlene is unfortunately not here today, I believe, is that correct? No. So, Sir Hilary Beckles, um, distinguished guests, academic and ancillary staff, students, and former students, friends, and family members. On behalf of my mother, Lady Brett Martin, my brothers, Roger and Richard, our wives, Anne, Sheila, and Marcia, Sir Sidney's first grandchild, Alison, who is also here with us today, and our extended family, I would like to thank Cave Hill Campus of the University of the West Indies for the honor you have bestowed in the memory of our father by naming your library the Sidney Martin Library on this, the golden anniversary of the Cave Hill Campus. This recognition given to our father for his contribution to the establishment and early development of the Cave Hill Campus is truly appreciated by the Martin family. Sidney Lancelot Martin was born in Jamaica on 27th of September, 1918. He attended Wilmer's Boys School, as did his two brothers and three sons. Family law has it that as a youngster, Sidney was blessed with a photographic memory and never had to open a book after school hours. So he spent many an evening and weekend playing bridge with the adults while his brothers swatted away. This fortunate trait, along with his copious notes, he carried with him throughout his long and distinguished academic career. He was awarded the Jamaica Scholarship in 1937 and went to England in 1938 where he enrolled in a BSc course at the Royal College of Science, Imperial College of London. After completing his master's in physical chemistry, he worked with Phillips Electrical International in Surrey in its Materials Research Laboratory. He returned to Jamaica in October of 1949 to take up a position as junior lecturer in chemistry 
in the then fledgling University College of the West Indies at the Mona campus. As children, we heard of his elaborate chemistry labs for which he was well known and in which his students honed their chemistry skills. Personally, I am grateful that he accepted that position at Mona as that allowed my brothers and I to grow up on the Mona campus during the formative and exciting years of the university. <coughs> this provided us as youngsters with the opportunity of interacting with the pioneering young men and women from all over the Caribbean who had come to Mona to further their university education not far from home. From the early years of our childhood, the Martin boys had the Mona campus as their playground, and it was fantastic. <laughs> Enough said of that. No doubt several of you present here today have heard of the exploits of the Martin boys at Mona. Fortunately, as today is our Father's Day, I do not have to go into this any further. I am sure that Sidney touched upon the lives of so many of his students, either in his role as lecturer in chemistry, warden of Taylor Hall, or as registrar. I believe that there are many Taylorites who still fondly remember his famous Sunday rum punch parties at the warden's residence in front of Block A. Imagine the counseling sessions that could have followed the hijinks of exuberant young students after these Appleton rum punch specials. I always fondly remember my father soaking a variety of fruit in rum for two days prior to the Sunday party. We boys were not allowed to partake of this concoction, but were permitted, quite strangely, to sample the rum-soaked fruit. <laughs> <laughs> this may very well have contributed to the Martin boys playing cricket on the roof of Block A, much to the amusement of the students and the consternation of our mother. Shortly after accepting the position of registrar at Moona, Sidney came to Barbados in early 1964 to assume the position of principal of the then College of Arts and Science and Technology, fondly called CAST, after the brief tenure of the late Leslie Robinson. CAST operated from a small building which is still standing today opposite the Costa Mannings at the Harbour Road across from Kensington Over. Martin Law has it, and this from our mother, that we can thank the late Right Honorable Errol Walton Barrow for introducing us to the lovely island of Barbados, as it was he who insisted to the university administration that Martin was the man for the job. He was seconded from Muna for a term of three years and stayed on here for 19 years until his retirement in 1983. Sidney Martin then proceeded to do what he did best, immerse himself totally in the task at hand and fully committed himself to this new venture, along with the able assistance of such well-known luminaries as Joan Johnson, his personal assistant, Sir Keith Hunt, Richard Olsop, Leonard Shorey, Henry Fazer, Victor Cook, Sylvia Mosley, Francis Woody Blackman, Michael Gill, Sir Woodfield Marshall, and of course Sir Arthur Lewis, his mentor, to mention but a few. The Martins often said Sidney was really married to the university, although mother was his first love. <laughs> <laughs> As a leader with his able team, he then proceeded to transform several acres of barren land above black rock and overlooking the Caribbean Sea into a premier and viable learning institution which today is a world recognized university campus attracting students from within and without the Caribbean region. Though we, his sons, were now grown and living abroad, we remember through conversations with our father and mother of the many trips he took to the USA, Canada, England, and other faraway places, tirelessly promoting the Cave Hill campus and encouraging the financial support that was then required to realize the dreams of this dedicated group of visionaries, which has allowed thousands of students to walk through the hallowed campus buildings and graduate in many disciplines during the past 50 years. 
Who then was Sidney Martin? I think that I can answer without excuse or hesitation. Sidney Martin was a team leader and a team player. He was a quintessential Caribbean man, bow tie and pipe, his personal trademark. He devoted himself to the mental and academic improvement of all Caribbean people, irrespective of their station in life. He was a man of vision, a man of action, who devoted himself to the university and left no stone unturned in his quest for excellence. His students were his life and pleasure, his colleagues his joy, the university and especially Cave Hill his passion. He laid the foundation stone for what we have at Cave Hill here today. He would be ever so proud to see the results of the fruits of his labor and would congratulate those who have taken up and passed on the baton of progress which has made Cave Hill what it is today, a truly vibrant and thriving academic institution. I think it fair to say that in his quiet moments, Sidney fondly thought of Cavill as his baby, although he readily and proudly acknowledged the contribution of so many of its unsung heroes from inception, infancy, through to maturity. His vision was always equality through academic achievement. This then was Sidney Martin, the man, son, husband, father, friend, advisor, counselor, academic administrator, colleague, perfectionist. He lived a life well lived by his personal motto, duty and responsibility. Sir Hilary, your choice in naming the library in memory of our father is a fitting tribute to a man who dedicated his adult life to the University of the West Indies in general and to the Cave Hill campus in particular. He was so infused in the education of others and I know he would be pleased to have been so honored. We thank you. Sir so Sidney, as he demitted office in 1983, may well have reflected on Valiant for Truth's famous words in Pilgrim's Progress. Though with great difficulty I have got hither, Yet now, I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage. That sword was passed to our, our next speaker, Sir Keith Hunt. Our founding fathers, both Vice Chancellors Robinson and Martin, were men of the exact and physical sciences who with care and precision plotted the foundation on which their successors, men of the humanities and men of history, would build and take flight. At our, <laughs> at our graduation ceremony two weeks ago, we saluted Sir Keith's stewardship of the charge handed to him by Sir Sidney, his own indelible flint, print, I'm sorry, on the Cave Hill lands escape, and his distinguished record of public service for which we at Cave Hill, and indeed our wider community, are much the richer. We welcome to the podium our former principal and a pro-vice chancellor, Sir Keith Hunt. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be given this opportunity to attend this important ceremony at which we acknowledge the tremendous contribution which Sir Sidney Martin has made to the growth and development of the University of the West Indies, and especially to this campus, over a career that extended over a period of 34 years. I'm especially pleased to acknowledge the presence of the members of the Martin family and do take our greetings to Lady Martin with her love. On the occasion that he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen in the New Year's Honours List of 1979, in recognition of his contribution to education in the West Indies in general, and Barbados in particular, I attended a simple yet moving ceremony across the way in the foyer of the library, hosted by the then campus librarian, I believe, Mr. Michael Gill, 
The occasion was to celebrate the Sydney's advancement. And I recall that a picture portrait of Sir Sidney and Lady Martin was unveiled on that occasion. And since then, the picture was on display in the foyer of the library thereafter. I gather that while we haven't called in Scotland Yard, over the last few days, there has been a frantic search to find out who may have borrowed it to which department. But I'm sure that the diligence of the principal will ensure that it returns to its place because we were told important events cast their shadows before it, the library. <laughs> it was already there in 1979, and uh, it will be added to by an even more fitting portrait in due course. When I received the invitation to attend this ceremony, therefore, I couldn't help but feel a deja vu. We knew this day would come. I gained admission to the University College of the West Indies at Mona in 1956. I thought that was good news. The second bit of good news that greeted me, however, upon my arrival in Jamaica and at the Mona campus was that I had been assigned to Taylor Hall for the duration of my program. It did not take me long to discover that I was fortunate to be a member of the Hall of Halls, <laughs> the Republic of Taylor Hall, later dubbed Tessum. <laughs> the home of the Tesses. I don't know what Tess is up to now, but it sounded good. And I see that I have my brothers and sisters with me. Not sisters then. Sisters were not legally allowed. <laughs> Mr. Sidney Martin, whose full-time job was senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry, was a resident water, warden of the hall. And as we just heard that very eloquent statement from Mr. Martin, Jr., and more of that and on. There were members of the hall, foundation members of the hall. <laughs> we left them there, and we had found them there. And we joined them in their home. Indeed, the hall could be said to be an extension of the Martin's backyard. <laughs> After graduating from Moon, I went to Canada as a postgraduate student. And then, good luck continued, I got a job at the College of Arts and Science, 1964. And guess who showed up as the principal? Because I had no idea until I arrived that he had recently succeeded, uh, Professor Leslie Robinson. So I was welcomed by my principal and former warden, Sidney Martin. I share these brief recollections in order to establish that it has been my good fortune to have had a close-up view of the tremendous contributions that Sidney has made to the university in the various offices, including university registrar, and as principal of this campus. As you have already heard, his capacity for hard work was legendary. At a time when a relatively small core of academic and administrative staff was struggling to cope with the challenges on this campus of heavy teaching loads and less than adequate resources, even as we sought to get our research projects underway, we knew that we could count on his advice and assistance in enabling fellowships and grants in order to effectively get that research activity underway. Student leaders knew that their access to membership on campus committees and boards and their access to the principal's office was unblocked. And that their participation in the work of the organs of the university was preparing them, the students, giving them an opportunity to effectively develop a sense of responsibility, a sense of shared responsibility for decision making. And I don't know that we can ever afford to lose that opportunity because we are talking about adult education. We are not talking about spoon feeding. And it is the life that is lived that makes much more sense in terms of development than simply passing a written exam. Sydney stood for that principle. The equanimity with which Sir Sydney presided over meetings of campus planning and estimates committee, and I pause here because somebody is about to say they're going to stand up and stretch, but he never wavered because he was there to see that the meeting concluded its agenda, its business. 
the equanimity that he displayed uh, in these committees, especially when the time came for preparing the triennial estimates, and when representatives of departments and faculties knew that we had to use the opportunity to show why our departments and faculties should have access to a share of these additional resources that might become available when the university got to grants committee. The battles, as Mr. Cook will remember, were fierce. Especially, I remember, I think we must tell it, the accelerated development of social sciences at Cave Hill needs to be written up as a chapter of the campus because it would have happened because it was part of the university's planning. But it helps if you have in your team the likes of the late Wendell McLean, the late, the, not the, very much with us, Sir Frank Ali. And we in the Faculty of Arts and General Studies, as it then was, were the parent of the early social science subjects to be introduced under the general studies program. And suddenly, the officers of the faculty found that we were suspect, that we were seeking to retard the natural development of the only faculty that made sense anywhere, the faculty of social sciences. It worked. That is, they did pretty well in getting significant increment. And why? Because of this promise of student numbers. It was in relation to that factor that they were able to play a key card and uh, I applaud their success and we all benefited from it. It is fitting then that the university and the Cavefield campus should on this occasion of our 50th anniversary recognize the solid and important contribution that Sir Sydney has made to the building, growth, and development of the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies. But I must now, as a footnote, say to the young Martins, I consider that you were officers of the hall. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know about the cricket in, 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 in Block A. But this was really a situation uh, in which Sir Sydney's rum punch parties uh, before abstinence <laughs> were occasions when many of us and the neighboring halls who would pretend to be Kate Taylor Wright and join us <laughs> were able to benefit, it, benefit from, yes, legendary hospitality of the Martin family. That is, it was not one of these occasions where you had a few drinks and then somebody looked, checked his watch and said, party's ended. The party died a natural death before somebody else died. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's so good to see you here. And I'm, I note the uh, regrets of your brother. Do convey to all members of the family our deepest appreciation. We will always be one of us. Principal, I congratulate your colleagues and yourself on the appropriateness of this occasion. And I would not have missed it, even if I had to take a bus. <laughs> Among this institution's first administrators was Mr. Victor Cook, who was a part of that early group operating out of the St. Michael School, who under the chairmanship of St. Augustine Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dudley Huggins were charged with, with the preparatory work for the opening of the new College of Arts and Science at Cave Hill. Mr. Cook has remained a constant in this campus's affairs until his retirement in 1994. Though his title may have gone through various iterations, accountant, finance officer, bursar, all knew him for what he was, an institution. An institution which has touched every single development initiative on the Cave Hill campus during his tenure. I believe that this year will provide further opportunity for us to salute his turning contribution and enjoy the rich store of anecdote which are part and parcel of his legacy at Cave Hill. A legacy still in the making as he has now transitioned to our seniors group, our retirees group. 
And uh, through that medium, he continues to serve and to support the Cave Hill campus, as he does from time to time when he picks up his pen in our public defense to great effect. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to be able to do this. Uh, this is a part of me that you have never seen before, standing up here before an audience of distinguished gentlemen, sirs and deans and all kinds of people. But you're all just like me, flesh and blood. And uh, I will try my best. Sir so Sidney Martin would have been 95 on the 27th of September, that is 27th of last month, he would have been 95. You're going to hear a lot of repetition because I think it is necessary and it is, because of the man he was, we need to repeat all of these enconiums about Sir Sidney. He was a winner of Jamaican scholarship in 1937, honors in chemistry from the University of London, Imperial College of Science and Technology, the governing body of which admitted him to its highest accolade of fellowship in 1981. He joined the university year after its inauguration in 1949 as a lecturer in physical chemistry. This is what the Chancellor said in 1983. He, Sidney Martin, laid the foundation for development of physical chemistry of the UWI. His punctilious, punctiliousness, his meticulousness, were not lost on the university administration. And thus he was appointed to Akers University Registrar from 1961 and 1964. Much against his will, of course, because I think teaching, that is what he wanted to do in life, to teach. After which he succeeded Professor Robinson as acting principal of the fledgling College of Arts and Science. It's probably the third or fourth time you heard about the fledgling College of Arts and Science. As acting principal, Initially, for two years, he was confirmed to the post in 1966 and also named a, as Pro Vice Chancellor for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. For the second time, Sir Sidney, Sidney Martin faced the challenge of building a new institution. This is what Sir Keith said of Sir Sidney on an occasion. To the tasks of recruiting staff, attracting students, planning and developing the new site for the college at Cave Hill, planning and effecting the establishment of the Eastern Caribbean Medical Scheme, now morphed into the Faculty of Medicine, the Faculties of Law, Social Sciences, and Education. So Sidney brought to work the emergent, so Sidney brought all his energy and capacities and tremendous energy to work in the establishment of these institutions. The emergence of Cave Hill as a viable campus of the university has to be seen as a monument to Sir Sidney Martin. Sir Sidney had an abiding interest in people. Students knew his door was always open to them. Quoting Sir Keith again, he opined that Sidney Martin brought to this university a personality that enabled him to get the best out of the people he led. Lady Martin and the three Martin sons, Richard, Philip, and, and Roger, were part of the university community. And you heard what an integral part of the university community they were in Jamaica. <laughs> the exploits of the Martin boys in, in Jamaica are legendary. And I hope that one day, at an appropriate time, these can be released. <laughs> it would not be appropriate to say those things now. <laughs> Sidney also gave yeoman service outside of the university. He served on several boards in Jamaica, including the Board of Management of Caste, and the Scientific Council. In Barbados, he also served in several capacities as chairman of the PSC from 1964 to 69, and was also the first chairman of the National Council of Science and Technology. In recognition of his many services, Sidney was knighted by the Queen in January 1979, and this university conferred on him the Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa in 1984 for his outstanding public service his contribution as a university administrator to the development of our university in general and the Cavefield campus in particular. Sidney retired in 1983 but never lost interest in the university, especially his beloved Cavefield campus. I don't know if you know how we got the name Cavefield, but uh, 
the, the few administrators we had, Sydney gathered us all together and said, what are we gonna name this? Thing? We can't call it the College of Barbados. We can't call it the Eastern Caribbean College. And then he said, well, it's going to be built on Cave Hill, so why not let us call it the Cave Hill Campus? And uh, I don't know if you know that when we were building the Faculty of Law and they started the foundation, bats started to fly out of the cave. So it is not by chance that it's called a cave, Cave Hill. The Department of History was able to get Sir Sidney to recount his experiences, and thus there's a record of his recollections in the university archives. Sir Sidney, in his rapport with his staff, dropped several pearls of wisdom, such as, poor people ought not to appear rich. <laughs> Be content with what you have. If you complain because you have no shoes, Go down the road and you're sure to see someone without any feet. I've read about people with photographic memories. I'm glad that I have had the privilege of meeting one such person in Sir Sydney. As a chairman of a meeting, and he never liked to finish a meeting. He would go through the agenda until it was completely finished. Sir Keith alluded to that famous meeting of KPEC, the Kfield Planning Estimate, when we were looking at the triennial estimates. And uh, <laughs> you talk about filibuster, this guy in the United States don't know anything about filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell McLean spoke for hours and hours. And much to Sydney's chagrin, he had to postpone the meeting because it was now past eight o'clock in the night. And so we started the meeting the next day. But the result of that is what you heard Sir Keith say. The Faculty of Social Sciences, the faculty that led the charge for this university to become what it was. And now we're turning the pendulum, the focus around now to science and technology. And as the principal said, so Sydney would have been very, very pleased with that. Because if there's one thing we had about Sir Sydney was his favor of the social, the, of the natural sciences. And so we had to steer him very gently away from that. <laughs> remembering that there were arts and the fledgling social sciences. But now the pendulum, has, the, the wheel has gone full circle and he, we are now going to have a science park. That's what I'm gonna call it. I'm glad that I have had the privilege of meeting Sir Sidney at, with a photographic memory. He never liked to finish meetings, as I said. He would come with a notepad, a new notepad at the beginning of the meeting and he would commence scribbling. Chairman, not secretary, he would be scribbling, writing, writing, writing. The result of those scribbles would be revealed without reference to the notes. So he just wrote it, uh, but out of his photographic memory. So once he wrote it, it landed in his memory. A remarkable man. Who said what, when, and the precise time such as 3.46 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> I asked him once how he did that. He simply said that once he wrote the note, it, it is photographed. Now we would say it is downloaded in his memory. <laughs> Several persons were there to Sir Sidney, but apart from his dear wife, Brett, who is still with us, his three sons and their families, None more so than his personal assistant, Joan Paris, who came out a Christmas day to type a 63 page report for him. Incidentally, Joan joined the university on the same day as Professor Robinson joined the, the Kfield campus on the 3rd of October, 1963. I, I was talking with Keith, Sir Keith before we began, and uh, I understand that there's a professor in Jamaica who refers to the people who started the university at uh, St. Michael's School and, and at uh, the harbor. Uh, we were Aborigines. <laughs> well, I think that's a good, I don't mind being an Aborigine. Well, the Aborigines sued the Australian government for a lot of money, so <laughs> careful, careful. And then there was Andrea Bryce, his secretary, and Eugene Bell, his faithful driver and confidant. The campus has been blessed by the quality of scholarship and dedication of its four principles. So Sidney laid a foundation on solid rock so that those who followed him could enlarge and build on that rock 
and the, that solid foundation. I'm glad that I was privileged to know and work with my friend and colleague, after whom, the co friend and colleague, because of whom we are met to name with pride the tools of education. We had a, a university bursar and then uh, a, a, a university, he was um, the principal of the, uh, the Mona campus and u university, uh, re not registrar, the university, um, whatever his name was. <laughs> he used to call, Aston Preston used to say that the library is at the art of the institution. <laughs> Oh, oh, and he said, he said it loud and clear many times. You, he said the library is at the art of the... And he said, you know, we must, we must provide for the library 10% of whatever the cost is of running the campus. And so we were faithful to that, as Michael Gill, who is here, can tell you. We were very faithful to that. I leave with you the oft-quoted stanza from one of Henry Wordsworth Longfellow's poems. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless the University of the West Indies.